Okay, so I'm very, very sorry for this delay. I hope it hasn't caused anyone too much trouble or inconveniences. Uh, these technical things sometimes are sudden and annoying. So I'm just going to start over and be very quick. I just want to say hello to everyone again and thanks for everyone again to be here at this third edition of West. Uh, we already introduced it, uh, one another, but just to repeat ourselves, my name is Martina Stella, and I'm a research fellow in Trieste, the ICTP Center. And together with Michael and Norbert, uh, we've been organizing this third edition of WEST, for which I will be the chairperson for today's seminars. Uh, maybe very quickly, uh, for uh, if new people have connected, uh, Michael and Norbert can introduce themselves uh, once again. Yeah. Hi, I am Norbert Bader. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the Leibniz University Hanover in Germany, studying mainly uh, EHL contacts. And uh, welcome to you all. And welcome from my side as well. I'm Michael Wolof from the University of Vienna. Usually I do high throughput uh, simulations with GSP, and uh, now I'm doing uh, live streaming, and that apparently is much harder than what I usually do because I managed to screw this up royally in the first half hour, but now it should work, uh, and I wish you a good seminar. Cool, thanks. I would never underestimate a YouTuber again. Um, so I was, I was going to say that this year theme that we have decided to choose for West is to look at the hot topic of learning about tools based on big data, high throughput, machine learning, artificial intelligence applied to tribology applications. Uh, we have seen that more and more people are getting interested in this topic and in mixing these two topics. So we put together a very nice lineup of speakers that could sort of introduce us to um, tribology application of machine learnings, but also introduce us to the tools that we might want to use if we get uh, really interested in uh, doing that ourselves as well. So I was going to say that we took over Chiara Gattinoni and James Ewan for the organization of this uh, web series Line last year. Speakers that could and we have slightly introduced us to, so I just wanted um, to give you some tribology details about of... this. We have decided to have uh, three separate days uh, the first day is today, the 30th of September. We have uh, another day of seminars on the 10th of October. And finally, we have the last day of, se of seminar on the 14th of October. On each of these days, we have two main invited speakers and three flash talks. We are going to, as you all learned by now, we are going to live stream everything on YouTube. Questions will be uh, in the chat, and um, uh, we're going to pick up the questions and uh, give them to the speakers at the end of the sessions. Uh, we also we also take questions from the speakers, uh, so they are in a, in a Zoom uh, a separate room. So if the speakers also wants to uh, have questions, they can write in the chat. They can raise hands, and we will take care of uh, of this. So without further ado, because we have already sort of uh, been a bit delayed by technical issues, I'm going to go and present our first speaker. I'm very, very happy to see again and to introduce to you Luca Gringelli. Uh, Luca uh, has a master in engineering, but uh, he went to have a PhD in physics from the University of Amsterdam. Uh, he joined the Fritz Haber Institute of Max Planck uh, with Matthias Schaeffler, where he was uh, leading the group about ab initial statistical mechanics of clusters, catalysis, and corrosion until probably uh, until 2015. And then uh, since then, he has been leading the big data analytics for material science in NOMAD uh, laboratory, which is where we met actually. Uh, and which is now uh, at Fritz Haber Institute and Humboldt University. So he also contributes uh, to coordinate the area of theory and computation in the Fermat Consortium at Humboldt University in Berlin. And uh, with, the Loma, with the NOMAD laboratory, he leads the development and applications of methods based on compressed sensing, symbolic regression, subgroup discovery, deep learning, and all of these uh, interesting tools that we're really looking forward to learn for uh, big data uh, in material science. But interestingly, he's also focusing on methods that can uh, get to interpretable models uh, uh, and can cope with also small data for training. 
So the title of this talk is, in fact, AI Ready Materials Science Fair Data uh, Methods and Infrastructure. And uh, sorry again for the delay. Please, Luca, go on with your talk. Thank you, uh, Martina, for the introduction and for inviting me here. Uh, so I guess I try to share my screen now. I don't know why this is already in the second slide. Okay, so Martina has already uh, mentioned my title. So artificial intelligence, ready material science, fair data, methods, and infrastructure. Um, uh, there will be essentially or uh, totally no uh, tribology in my talk. <laughs> so I uh, I will focus on uh, the, the infrastructure that we have been building uh, uh, for uh, material science uh, data. Um, and uh, most part of the of my talk would be uh, about artificial intelligence method to analyze uh, the data. So we'll go a little bit back and forth uh, uh, between methods and infrastructure, but then uh, uh, the second part of the talk, I will say I, I am uh, very focused on, uh, on on methods, hoping that uh, they will be uh, interesting to you, even though the applications are uh, uh, probably far from, from your uh, current interest. Um, so uh, I, I like to start with a general uh, introduction on uh, on the terminology in uh, uh, about big data and, uh, and uh, artificial intelligence tools and methods. Um, so according to to some uh, uh, people in the field. Uh, we are facing, uh, uh, we are experiencing the fourth paradigm, paradigm in, uh, in, uh, in science, where the, 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 the first paradigm was uh, pure empirical science uh, prior to, let's say, uh, scientific revolution uh, in the early uh, 1600s, uh, where uh, theory and, uh, and uh, experiments started uh, playing together. Um, so the so-called scientific method, uh, and according to most, uh, uh, at some point uh, uh, in the second half of the past century, we started a, a third paradigm where computer simulation uh, entered uh, strongly into the uh, set of tools that people use in, uh, in science, uh, in as much uh, one can uh, simulate systems for which uh, something is known, but uh, uh, some observable are uh, derived only by, by doing uh, computer simulation more and more extensive. Um, and the new uh, key in the block is the use of uh, artificial intelligence in several aspects uh, uh, with scientific data, uh, be it to speed up certain calculations or uh, even more interesting to interpret uh, some results uh, that are not so uh, easy to uh, understand just by looking at them. Uh, and this is essentially the, the area where I, I, I'm most interested in, um, but I will uh, be a bit more general at the beginning. So the um, idea of, uh, of doing uh, uh, artificial intelligence uh, on, on data uh, someone requires that that one uh, uh, is able to uh, store uh, properly the data uh, in order to guarantee uh, this is called reproducibility. Um, with reproducibility, I put together replicability uh, and reproducibility, uh, meaning that one can do exactly the same thing or uh, obtain similar results with similar settings. Um, so the idea is that uh, data should be uh, fair, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And um, uh, I've been working uh, uh, with and for uh, uh, building this, this in, in infrastructure that is called Novel Material Discovery, uh, that is online since uh, the late 2014, um, where we uh, deal uh, so far uh, with the computer, um, so atomistic uh, simulation codes uh, and uh, the, the, the normal infrastructure uh, hosts uh, a row input and output files uh, from these uh, calculations. Um, 
most of the data that you would find there are from VFT calculation at the moment, but we are expanding faster to uh, force fields and uh, say beyond VFT excited states and, and so on. Uh, the kind of original idea of the normal material discovery is that uh, uh, on one side, we uh, store exactly the input and output uh, of the calculations. Um, and then we have uh, a, a way to map from this uh, raw input output into an internal representation um, uh, that is uh, uh, as much as possible independent uh, uh, of the code that was used to produce the data. And this um, uh, so-called archive is the entity that is queried by an API that has been developed in, uh, in our team um, and allows for different levels of, uh, of analysis of the data. Uh, here summarized by this uh, encyclopedia that is essentially the browser uh, of the data and the artificial intelligence toolkit that is uh, uh, the, the area where I am most active in, in the NOMAD uh, laboratory. Uh, so the toolkit, the artificial intelligence toolkit is, is a web-based uh, platform uh, that hosts uh, a curated set of uh, um, Jupyter notebooks that allow people to um, analyze with artificial intelligence tools uh, the data that are in the, in the NOMAD archive. Um, so you, you find it uh, at, this, uh, at this link. Uh, in any case, if you have problems, just write to me to, to, to find uh, uh, what I'm talking about today. Um, the current main developer of the toolkit, uh, I want to give credit to, to Luigi Spilo uh, that has uh, been working hard in the last, uh, say, couple of years. Uh, at the interface level, but also at the uh, uh, core level of the of the infrastructure of the artificial intelligence uh, toolkit infrastructure, um, and so uh, I want to mention that the same thing that you would find uh, online is uh, also uh, shipped uh, um, to work independently on uh, on local machines, including a laptop. So you would have exactly the same uh, software and you could access the data in the Nomad archive that in the same way on your uh, uh, computer. Um, so the, the purpose of this uh, artificial intelligence toolkit uh, is uh, uh, threefold. So on one side is giving direct access to the, uh, to the uh, Nomad archive by uh, our metadata schema that is called MetaInfo. Um, and uh, in order to perform directly artificial intelligence uh, uh, analysis on uh, on the data in a in a online uh, Jupyter notebook, so one can uh, directly try uh, doing some analysis without uh, need to install anything. Keeping the spirit, uh, yeah, that's they said. Um, ah, yes, it is important that at this level uh, no registration is uh, is uh, required. Uh, at the same time, we offer a library of uh, hands-on um, tools uh, uh, in order to perform ready-made uh, artificial intelligence analysis on, uh, on, on some data. So just to showcase uh, what one can do. Uh, and we balance between uh, uh, kind of textbook uh, methods uh, that one may find on, say, scikit-learn. Um, uh, so Python library uh, and method that we have uh, uh, introduced ourselves uh, uh, from the normal laboratory. And this is what I will be talking in the uh, next part of the talk, uh, these, these methods that are a bit unusual. Um, and uh, also the uh, mission of the, of the notebook, uh, so of the toolkit is to uh, offer a platform where people can uh, store uh, essentially the uh, analysis uh, workflow uh, done on uh, uh, ab initio data uh, in order to perform, uh, uh, in order to uh, reach some publication level results. So ideally for each uh, publication that has some artificial intelligence analysis on uh, ab initio data or uh, for scale based data, atomistic data in material science, um, one can produce uh, a notebook and, and uh, have it stored uh, essentially 
fingerprint, and then, and then uh, one gets a, a unique identifier, a DOI to the notebook uh, in order to have it as a sort of extended uh, um, um, supplementary information to a publication, a very interactive one that hopefully uh, helps people in going deep into what uh, one has uh, developed and, and, and obtained. Uh, so people can reproduce and uh, very simply uh, try something slightly different without need uh, of lengthy re-implementations and, and so on. So we, we hope that we are uh, fostering the uh, kind of uh, boosting of uh, reproducibility in uh, uh, at least uh, computational uh, material science. Um, so the, the infrastructure is now uh, expanding also to experimental data. Uh, but this is just uh, at the beginning. Uh, so at the moment, uh, we are kind of strong on, uh, on uh, computational data. Um, so this said, uh, I would like to go into, uh, uh, okay, sorry. Uh, this is just a, a snapshot. This is the, the, the entry page. And this would be a snapshot of uh, uh, the list of the notebooks that one finds. Uh, with uh, some uh, kind of uh, metadata on the notebook that tell which kind of method and system is uh, is um, uh, is being used and investigated. Um, okay, so uh, rest of my talk is is about uh, methods, methods that are implemented. So uh, as a disclaimer, okay, let me go back. This can be distracting now. Um, um, methods that are, um, uh, so all the methods that we'll be talking about uh, uh, are uh, available in the, in, the, in the toolkit. That's why this is a lengthy introduction. So uh, uh, after this talk, this talk, if you are curious about some method and some details uh, been a bit uh, hard to grasp from, from my presentation, you just go to the uh, uh, related uh, notebook and uh, you have plenty of time to go through uh, all the detailed steps. And, uh, and understand uh, what has been going on. Okay, so uh, in order to introduce the methods that, that we have been developing, um, I, uh, I make a very quick uh, general introduction on artificial intelligence, just to be sure uh, we are on the same page when I mention certain uh, terms. So first of all, we have the, the big container that is called artificial intelligence. That is basically uh, the set of all algorithms that in one way or another uh, try to mimic human uh, intelligence. So this is not uh, necessarily related to, to learning, uh, but every algorithm that, uh, that makes uh, decisions uh, or may, tries to make predictions uh, is uh, called artificial intelligence, even if it is uh, uh, not trained. So the, the programmer really tries to guess all possibilities and implement uh, uh, a bit in a hard way, uh, all, all the models. Nowadays, this, this part of artificial intelligence is not much explored, um, but uh, uh, that, that's the big uh, container of uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, what um, one can uh, uh, subdivide uh, artificial intelligence into before I get to machine learning, that is, of course, the big word that uh, uh, everybody uh, hears about, is that uh, uh, one can do uh, essentially two very different types of, uh, of uh, analysis on, uh, on, uh, on data. Um, that is uh, uh, the quite common, uh, uh, I would say, confirmatory analysis. When, when people uh, talk about doing uh, some artificial intelligence on, uh, on, on some data, uh, typically they have in mind some regression or classification model uh, and the training of this regression or classification model. Uh, quite interesting is also the so-called exploratory analysis. Um, that uh, uh, allows for uh, uh, yeah, exploring, interpreting uh, data uh, in a more free way. So it's not just trying to predict a specific value, but to have a representation of the data that uh, suggests something to, to the user, to the scientist in this case. So I like to see this exploratory analysis as a nice companion to uh, scientific research. Uh, nope, the other direction. Okay, going to a little bit more standard classification. Uh, so as you see, I, I removed this classification because uh, exploratory versus confirmatory is independent of, uh, uh, say, uh, that this other classification that is machine learning. So you could have machine learning in both uh, subsets. 
And machine learning is uh, the subset of artificial intelligence where uh, uh, algorithm learns. Uh, and learning means uh, that the algorithm uh, improve uh, strictly uh, the more data is provided uh, to, to the algorithm to uh, um, um, infer the, 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 the model. Um, mathematically, this is done via a trick that is called uh, regularization. And I will talk a little bit about regularization in the next part of the talk. Um, but the important thing is that uh, learning means uh, really improving uh, with more data. A subset of machine learning that has been, I would say, recognized only more recently uh, is uh, representation learning. Even though methods have been around, uh, people started, started talking about uh, representation learning only in the last few years, to my knowledge. And, and, and this is the set of algorithms uh, that uh, learn uh, a representation together with the model. So there are a lot of machine learning algorithms in which one gives uh, some input representation and the model is trained on that representation, uh, meaning that there is some typically highly nonlinear function that is learned on the whole representation. But there are methods that uh, kind of uh, extract a representation out of the input uh, that is given to the, to the algorithm. Uh, deep learning is clearly in this class. So for those of you that uh, have been doing anything with deep learning, uh, you might know uh, that uh, a, a deep network is uh, uh, learning an internal representation uh, that typically is hidden in some uh, of the so-called hidden layers. Um, people do not need to access it, but sometimes exploring uh, how the internal representation looks like gives some insight. We have done some work in this direction, but uh, decided not to put it today. Um, so I will focus on the so-called symbolic inference that is a, a, a bit of a, a unusual uh, uh, approach and where we have uh, made some, uh, yeah, possibly a nice contribution that people can uh, use uh, in uh, also in, uh, in tribology, for example. Um, so just to translate, inference is again uh, a way to say learning from data, and symbolic uh, is uh, uh, um, hinting at the fact that the, the models that are learned are explicit uh, analytic equations. Um, now, of course, every model is uh, eventually a set of uh, um, at least mathematical uh, uh, expressions, um, uh, but uh, uh, symbolic regression tries to do it uh, in the in a transparent way. So to have a somewhat simple uh, model that one can uh, uh, um, inspect and uh, uh, to some extent uh, interpret, as I will try to show. So in this class, we have uh, um, symbolic regression classification and uh, um, also uh, another a common uh, uh, tool that is called uh, 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 subgroup discovery. Sorry, I was looking at if there was anything interesting in the chat, <laughs> but it's just about the break. Okay. Um, okay. In any case, I guess Martina will interrupt me if there is any question that uh, clearly you you are free to uh, do to interrupt me and ask at any moment. Um, okay, so let me go uh, directly to uh, this uh, uh, combination. Uh, uh, so this uh, symbolic inference uh, with the uh, first of the methods. Um, so um, the, 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 the first approach uh, is a combination of uh, symbolic regression and compressed sensing. Uh, and then I am explaining uh, in this slide what I mean by that. So uh, what is compressed sensing? The idea is to express uh, a, a property of, uh, of a system uh, as a linear expansion of a, over a basis functions that in physics is always a very nice idea. Um, the, the basis functions here are uh, nonlinear, um, well, those will be linear, but typically are nonlinear functions of some input features that one uh, kind of selects for, for, for the system at hand. So I will show some example. And this is the step where you need the kind of uh, domain expert, as people say in machine learning. So you have to fence a little bit what could be important. As I will try to explain, it is not super important that you guess everything uh, correctly. Uh, so if you give some redundant features or uh, completely unimportant features, uh, the method is uh, well equipped to uh, uh, neglect these features 
in a very clear way. So you will learn that some features are completely not important or redundant. Um, if you miss uh, features, uh, then of course uh, your model probably will not be very good, but also that you will see from the by the performance of the model itself. So um, if this uh, uh, linear expansion here uh, is truncated at, at very uh, small number of coefficients and still the prediction, the performance of the model is quite good, uh, we are in the realm of uh, so-called compressed sensing. So uh, mathematically is, is written as a, a kind of regression uh, problem. So minimizing the, uh, the, the difference between the known uh, values of the property and the predicted one by the linear model. Uh, under the constraint that the number of non-zero coefficients in this expansion is as small as possible. This is what is known as compressed sensing. Um, this is not always uh, possible. Uh, you need that, that such representation exists, um, but uh, uh, if these nonlinear functions are created uh, uh, carefully, this representation typically emerges. And graphically, uh, what we are doing is essentially to do to solve a linear system uh, where the number of uh, columns in uh, in the matrix, so this is essentially the number of basis function in this expansion, is uh, large, typically much larger than the number of data points. This is where this uh, small data enters. Um, that uh, and the thing works uh, because uh, we just uh, uh, allow few of the uh, coefficients to be non-zero, and therefore we pick up columns in this matrix. So that this means that in this expansion we are few uh, components. And this is the in a nutshell what is compressed sensing. What is symbolic regression? Well, uh, I already mentioned what it means, uh, but but in uh, as a word, uh, but as, a, as an algorithm, it means that we uh, construct uh, a mathematical expression by combining uh, features with operators. We have a, have a cover of operators, say starting from simple, some linear ones, uh, condition, uh, powers and a set of uh, elementary mathematical function, but here one can, can be uh, as uh, creative as uh, one likes. Um, and then these uh, features are combined with the, with the expressions, with the operators, to, to, to yield a more and more complex expression. The, the reason why I represent it as a tree like this, uh, that you see here, is that this is the way it is actually implemented uh, in, in all symbolic regression codes. Uh, and this is a, um, a nice way to do it because the, you can always substitute uh, a, a node with a subtree and always get an expression that is mathematically well formed. Um, and this is my engineer uh, heart that <laughs> suggested this because <laughs> everybody that's been working with an HP calculator knows you know, what I'm talking about. Um, um, Anyway, uh, so the method in itself uh, uh, has this uh, ugly name. Uh, I can say it because I, <laughs> I invented the name, so I'm free to bash it. And it's called uh, uh, sure independent screening plus uh, sparsifying oh, type of sparsifying operator. Uh, in short, CISO. There is no correlation with CISA in Trieste, but uh, it just came up like that. Um, so uh, this is. Essentially, everything I say about the method, uh, I once more uh, uh, redirect you to the to this uh, nice notebook uh, done by one of my students uh, on, on, the, on a tutorial introduction to the method, where we start from a simple linear regression and then introduce step by step uh, all the all the uh, ingredients of uh, of uh, the, the fully fledged method, including uh, the recently uh, um, uh, published. Uh, C++ code very efficient to, to, to perform this, uh, this uh, method. And um, the only extra thing I want to say about this method is that uh, uh, it has a built-in uh, uh, way to um, uh, determine the complexity of the model. So the complexity comes uh, in two terms. Uh, one is the depth of this symbolic tree. So how many uh, layers you have in the tree when you, when you generate it um, and the number of these active dimensions. So in this linear expansion, how many dimensions are different from zero and the methodology as a way to uh, um, uh, determine the optimal complexity and stop when uh, that is reached. Okay. 
uh, slowly going towards uh, applications. So the uh, purpose of, 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 of this approach, one of the main purposes, and this is why we get this, uh, we, we insist on, on the linear expansion, is that we uh, are aiming at uh, materials maps. Uh, so uh, representation of the material space uh, where materials uh, are points that uh, described by a certain descriptor. And, and then you get uh, uh, possibly classification. So points uh, landing in some part of the map uh, are uh, crystallized in this example as zinc blend or as rock salts. Um, and, and then you can have uh, uh, more classifications uh, and, uh, and also uh, maps of continuous properties like you are interested in absorption energy and uh, and a certain um, set of materials have, say, CO2 uh, absorbed uh, in a range of interest for, uh, say, catalytic uh, behavior. But the, the, the common uh, idea is that we would like to have this representation that is low dimensional and somewhat inspectable, ideally two dimensional. Um, uh, but of course, it could be higher dimension, and the complexity, as I was saying, is determined by the method, by the data, uh, and, and by the system itself. So, um, a kind of showcase application that that uh, I start uh, to show is this um, uh, uh, one of the first we made. Um, that is uh, trying to find uh, a simple uh, descriptor for predicting whether materials with the chemical formula ABX3 would crystallize or not as perovskite. So perovskite is this crystal here where you have this uh, um, cubic arrangement of uh, octahedra. In the middle, you have uh, kind of the big cation, uh, normally A, and then uh, the uh, uh, small cations in, in the center of the octahedra, and then uh, the, the, the vertices of the octahedra are uh, uh, the anion uh, atoms. Um, um, that's it, so, yeah, in, in, in this arrangement. And, and uh, historically, uh, this guy Goldschmidt, uh, essentially 100 years ago, uh, came up with uh, this simple descriptor to predict whether a material would, uh, would be um, um, uh, perovskite or not. Uh, the um, input is uh, for each isolated atom, so an information that you know about the material, the uh, chemical element, the, the moment you select it for testing whether it would build a perovskite or not, um, is uh, this uh, so-called ionic radius. Uh, I don't need to say now what exactly this is. It's just something that you can look up in a table, uh, given, uh, uh, so you have the periodic table of this ionic radius. Um, so with this um, descriptor, if um, materials uh, um, end up in this uh, interval here, uh, they are predicted to be perovskite. And the accuracy of this prediction is fairly good, but not ex super exciting, especially if the anion is not uh, oxygen. To be honest, course, we was thinking about uh, um, perovskite oxides, oxides uh, but OK. And so we wanted to know if we can learn a, a better descriptor uh, by applying our method instead of just uh, doing trial and error. Essentially, the trial and error is done by the, uh, the machine itself. And we came up with um, uh, uh, more complicated descriptor, but the gridlets are exactly the same. So this radii, this oxidation state is also part of the definition of this ionic radii. And, and just looking at the uh, harsh split at a certain uh, optimal threshold, this descriptor has a, a very good accuracy in prediction. I'm talking about prediction, but it is even nicer that the moment you define a kind of uh, uncertainty interval, uh, everything that is outside this interval uh, is predicted with 100% accuracy. And in between, one can define, we did define a probability to be or not uh, um, a perovskite. So we end up with a continuous uh, uh, mapping. Um, and, and this allows us to, to, to build the, uh, what we were looking for, uh, this uh, materials map. So if we use uh, the A and B material in terms of the radii as descriptor, um, we have uh, uh, this, this uh, learned uh, uh, equation, and then we have that material in blue are uh, predicted to be perovskite, in red, they're predicted not to be perovskite. And in between, you have this uncertainty region. Uh, and, and the material here are those that are known already to be not perovskites, and, and the model uh, works uh, very, very nicely. Uh, uh, by looking at, at, at the way this formula is done, we can also be brave and say, what if we can analyze also double perovskite, assuming that the uh, 
there is some kind of uh, averaging going on when trying to build a, a double peroskite that has two types of uh, B cation in the center of the octahedra. They don't need to be ordered, um, like in this uh, picture here. Um, so we say, what if we just take the average between the D and uh, B prime cation and make prediction? Uh, you, we use exactly the same form without retraining. Uh, this complicated <laughs> metrics just say that uh, when, whenever we predict something to be uh, peroskite with this uh, more complex formula, uh, uh, we, 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 we were right uh, and we predicted uh, thousands of new uh, double peroskites. Uh, uh, some of them uh, in the meanwhile, since 2019, were also uh, synthesized. Um, um, this, um, uh, say, application is, uh, as I was saying, a notebook. So I'm just showing quickly that uh, there is a notebook for uh, in reproduce results in this called finite tolerance factor predicting to predict peroskite stability with CISO. Um, this would be the, the entry uh, screen uh, to, to, to the notebook. And uh, one of the results of the notebook is that you would be able to uh, draw interactively these maps here. So th this is a snapshot from the, from the notebook that obviously it uses exactly the same library that we use for the paper. So that's why it looks so similar. But the thing is that you can do it on the fly. And then you have uh, different data and you have uh, you want to look for different properties. You can just modify on the fly a notebook and, and try your ideas. OK, now I will. Uh, go uh, by more and more complexity. Um, so uh, one, one um, uh, um, to me, very uh, interesting uh, extension that we did of this uh, CISO method is um, um, the uh, extension to, to multitask learning. Um, so the, mathematically, the idea is that we learn different properties at once, uh, but by learning, uh, but by imposing to use the same descriptor. As I mentioned, so in, in the single task CISO, this SD CISO, uh, learning the descriptor means that we identify the columns in the matrix uh, uh, in, the, in our linear problem. Um, having a multitask means that we identify the same columns, uh, but the, 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 the properties are, uh, are changing. <clears throat> Furthermore, uh, these gray areas here signify um, uh, the situation in which uh, data are incomplete. So we don't have all properties known for all materials in the training set. Uh, this is not something we invented. Uh, people have been doing uh, multitask learning uh, for quite a while, and it has always this uh, extreme robustness problem. So you can, if you don't have enough data to train one property, train more properties <laughs> under the constraint that the model is the same. Um, um, and then you will, uh, you will, uh, uh, so kind of uh, impose robustness to the to, to the model, and you can uh, achieve a fine model with the relatively small data. Um, again, mathematically, this looks like uh, property one is a function of, uh, uh, so the descriptor is the same, but the learn coefficient in the linear regression can change and will change. So this is how it looks like. So it, 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 one can summarize this by saying that the coefficient itself in the linear expansion depends on the way you um, index, in some sense, the different tasks. So you could have a, 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 a finite set of tasks uh, that I will try now to, to exemplify a, bit, a little bit. And then you have that the, the coefficient depends on the kind of the enumeration of the tasks. Or you could have also a continuous set of tasks. And this will be, as I will show, the most interesting uh, extension. So the kind of uh, straightforward application is when we have a finite set of tasks. Uh, uh, let's say that we are learning the formation energy for uh, uh, the same uh, uh, chemical composition in different crystal phases, because we are after constructing a, a kind of uh, a material phase diagram in which we want to predict uh, uh, what would be the, the most stable crystal phases, given the, uh, the, the formula. Um, so this works, uh, uh, and, and, and the fact that we impose the same descriptor uh, allows us to really draw the, the phase diagram. See, this is for uh, octet binaries, when we predict when they crystallize zinc blend, rock salt, cesium chloride, and there are other phases that would not appear in the, in the phase diagram, but they, they, uh, they could be metastable. Like, uh, and, and this would be a cut of the same plot. Uh, even when uh, uh, rock salt is more stable, uh, this uh, nickel arsenide in some 
regions is, is, is very close in, in, in energy. So one can expect to have a metastable phases. So you have a full um, prediction on, uh, on uh, relative stability of, of materials on the basis of, of the chemical formula. So all these uh, radii and this is a uh, distance of the, the, the dimers are um, uh, properties of the isolated atoms or, or, or small molecules that uh, can be looked up in a, in, a, in a database. So you don't have to construct the material in order to know uh, which uh, chemical, um, which crystalline phase will be more stable. Uh, so in this case, uh, essentially the index that goes through the, the different tasks uh, uh, kind of uh, um, um, summarize uh, the, the different structures themselves in a, in a, in a kind of in, uh, implicit way. So we would have that the, uh, the, the model is the same for all crystal phases and then we have different prediction for different crystal phases. Now, uh, a situation in which uh, uh, we have a continuous property could be, for example, let me go back here, uh, a situation in which uh, uh, we have the same material at different temperatures. So temperature is a continuous property. And if we sample the material at different temperatures, we can say that each temperature is a task in this formalism. But then we would have uh, that the coefficient could evolve, um, the coefficients could evolve uh, uh, smoothly from one temperature to the other. And this is exactly what we achieved in this uh, uh, kind of uh, very nice application published last year uh, in a heterogeneous catalysis. So we are going really to real materials and, and real uh, kind of uh, problems. So we were after this uh, kind of, uh, um, yeah, simplified chemical reaction. Actually, the the the, the actual network is uh, is the is, is here, and uh, we uh, orga inorganic chemists uh, as well as organic <laughs> like to pick up a few of them to say, okay, we are after this uh, this kind of um, uh, um, oxidation reaction, um, and we would like to see whether uh, uh, this uh, we, we can uh, learn a model um, uh, by knowing the um, uh, the behavior. Uh, of these uh, nine uh, vanadium-based catalysts. So you heard correctly, we have nine data points. And we want to learn a model on, on these nine data points. So these are known uh, catalysts. Um, and this is a pure experimental uh, effort. So in the group of uh, Robert Schlegel at the Fritz Haber, uh, Institute, uh, people did uh, a tour de force uh, in experimenting, characterizing material before the reaction, during the reaction, after the reaction, uh, and, and so on, so that we have a lot of properties uh, for, from the same material measured in a, in a very consistent way. And then we are after finding, for example, I will show here the selectivity in producing a, a, a acrylic acid, assuming that acrylic acid is a product that we like to obtain. I'm told by uh, inorganic chemists that it, that's the case um, for uh, um, constructing uh, olefins. Uh, so you start with acrylic acid and the selectivity towards this reaction is, uh, so the high test selectivity is welcome. And, and the model that is constructed is a, a simple model with just uh, uh, two uh, components uh, that depends on temperature, right? So the, the material is described by a, a fixed uh, um, yeah, set of uh, uh, parameters, so the, the descriptor, but the coefficient in, in, in order to predict the, the uh, selectivity depends on temperature. Okay, uh, and this is the behavior of the coefficient as a function of temperatures, and they go opposite in order to catch the fact, uh, yeah, different materials have very different behavior in terms of um, um, their uh, selectivity. Uh, this would be the map uh, if we co collapse the descriptor into one dimension um, and have the temperature as another dimension, and we have these uh, isocurves of equal selectivity. So this material would be the winner. Um, uh, with the high selectivity in, in this region. Uh, but we can do much more, uh, sorry. Um, uh, when we have seen the model, we say, okay, let's see uh, what constitutes the model. So this descriptor is a function of some uh, mesoscale um, properties like the pore volume of the, this is a real catalyst in a real reactor. So we, we can measure uh, the pore fraction or we can measure um, uh, more electronic uh, properties like uh, the activation energies uh, uh, of conductivity, its work function and so on. They appear here. And then one can say, let's assume that we can manipulate the material in order to change some of these uh, uh, properties. Uh, so the pore uh, fraction, for example, can be 
more or less easily manipulated uh, by uh, syn synthesis, uh, and also some some treatment can change the um, um, this uh, uh, activation energy uh, of the bulk conductivity, um, and so one can uh, basically change this this uh, material here and go to a, a much more uh, selective material uh, that maybe is. Uh, much less costly than this other one. So at the moment, this is not part of the, this investigation, but this is just to say, train a model uh, that one can inspect, uh, see what are the relevant parameters, and then try to uh, uh, intervene on the, on the material in order to, to, to improve it. Um, okay. Um, I have, it's about five minutes, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, I can, I can wrap up in five minutes. Um, Maybe I skip this one. Uh, I want to to make an interesting point here. So, um, if the model is not uh, particularly simple, uh, we have designed also a strategy to um, kind of uh, statistically, uh, so doing some statistical analysis on the model itself in order to uh, learn a little bit more uh, um, what is important and what is less important in the model. So in this case, I spare you the, um, the mathematical uh, part. I, I go directly to the application, hoping that it, uh, it's interesting enough. And then uh, there is also a notebook, of course, uh, also for this uh, application and, 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 and development. Um, so the idea is that we were um, uh, modeling the uh, lattice thermal conductivity. We start from 75 uh, materials from which we have computational, uh, sorry, experimental data on the thermal conductivity, but we can also characterize them uh, from a computational point of view. So this is combined computational and, and experimental um, uh, kind of uh, learning procedure. Um, <clears throat> so this is, um, of a model, mm, so we make the prediction, and this is uh, our, our ground fruit. The model is trained on the logarithm for the conductivity because it spans uh, several orders of magnitude, um, and and the model, as usual, is a linear expansion, um, and then it is okay, fairly simple, but not the simplest one can imagine. Um, there are several ingredients coming in, um, and one would like to understand how to. Um, identify the leading uh, parameters in order to, for example, uh, um, screen materials and identify which one has large or particularly large or particularly small uh, thermal conductivity. Um, to do that, um, um, as, as usual, when there is something mathematical um, and that, 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 that you want to do on, on something, go to, to, to some Russian mathematician, for sure. Uh, there is a Russian mathematician that has solved your problem. And this is a case also here, <laughs> Sobol has, uh, has solved our problem, even though it has been discovered a few times. Um, and so there is a way to do some kind of uh, um, uh, sensitivity analysis that is, um, um, an ensemble sensitivity analysis. Normally, sensitivity analysis is done feature by feature. Uh, and this uh, uh, um, statistical approach by Sobol uh, allows our one to, to, to look at the, the interrelationships uh, uh, among features. So if we apply these uh, uh, indexes um, uh, to, to, to our model, we find that only three of the features uh, play a leading role. And, and I'm going to say what they are because it is important for the conclusion. That is uh, the molar volume, Vm is the molar volume of the material. Um, theta d infinite is the uh, infinite temperature limit of the, uh, the by temperature. In practice, it is related to the um, uh, spread of the, uh, of the uh, phonon uh, um, eigenvalues. Um, so it's a static calculation on uh, using phonons that gives us this number. And, and this sigma A is an anharmonicity uh, index that requires to do molecular dynamics trajectory and essentially compare how much uh, 
the, 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 the potential energy sorbent is, uh, is not uh, harmonic. So this is just a number that comes out of certain analysis. But uh, to, uh, just for you to understand, uh, so this is related to the lattice constant. You just need to uh, find the, the equilibrium lattice constant of, uh, of your material. Here you need to do a phonon calculation, harmonic phonons, OK, involved, but uh, doable. And here, there, uh, this requires molecular dynamics in order to process uh, the size of this uh, property. Now, we say we, we tune, uh, we, we set up the, the challenge that we want to find materials that have low thermal conductivity. Uh, and we see by, by looking at the, say, 3D, uh, basically manifold onto which this material leaves, if we consider only these uh, three uh, input parameters that um, um, the materials that have low thermal conductivity have uh, low lattice constant, um, molar volume, uh, large uh, divide temperature, and small probably is the opposite. Um, anyway, uh, and small uh, um, um, anharmonicity factor. Um, yeah, OK, I actually can see. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's small. Uh, uh, small and large. Um, anyway, um, so this uh, uh, observation suggests that one can set up a, a high throughput search in which one first looks at, at the structural uh, information, so the lattice constant, then harmonic information, and then anharmonic information. So I'm pretty sure you have seen uh, these uh, kind of uh, high throughput funnels uh, over and over. They were introduced uh, probably in our field. Uh, I mean, I've seen them the first time in works from uh, materials project. Um, the, the novelty here is that uh, when we start the investigation, we have no idea how to build the funnel. So we have these 75 materials and, and the, the main output of, of, of building a, a machine learning model is not the predictive model in itself. It's the fact that it tells us that if you screen for some simple structural properties and then in cascade on the harmonic properties and then on the harmonic properties, you reach your desired result. Um, so this is a, a kind of a, a nice um, uh, side effect of a, a simple model that it can be uh, uh, in um, some what, inspected and interpreted, um, but it turned out to be here our main uh, uh, main, uh, main main results. So because we constructed to do that, and I'm confident that you can do this kind of uh, analysis on on very uh, different systems. So essentially, I close here. If I manage to jump to the last slide, because I have a few other slides, yes. <laughs> um, and this is just the acknowledgement, uh, and I uh, arrived. Uh, so you, you have not seen uh, one, one topic, but that, that, that's fine. Um, so I would like to to, to acknowledge all these people. Uh, Jan Vibra did introduce uh, uh, us to the marvels of uh, compressed sensing and symbolic regression, and then Lucas Foppa doing uh, some of this application. And uh, OK, it's completely missing uh, one important person, uh, Thomas Purcell, um, that made the, 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 the last thing uh, that, that, that I presented. Um, and, and then, of course, Matthias Schaeffer, uh, who has been behind uh, all these uh, activities all the time. Uh, I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Luca, for uh, your very nice talk. Maybe we can give you a round of virtual applause. Uh, you know, Zoom, Zoom allows that, so I'm going to yes. do that. Thank there you, you go. <laughs> Thank you very much. It was a very, very nice talk. We have already a couple of questions from, uh, so please, the speakers, feel free to uh, write. So, I, I stopped uh, sharing, but I can go back any moment. In case. Yeah. So for the speakers, feel free to either raise your hand or write your questions in the chat. I'm going to start reading the first one I see here. I think it's from Norbert, who can ask it himself or I read it. If that's fine, I will read it. He's asking, uh, how sensitive are the methods to differences and uncertainties in measurements forming from uh, forming the data basis for training? OK, yes, thanks. Um, that's a very good point. Uh, I, I didn't go uh, in, in, into these details. Uh, I mean, details, not, not, not very much details. This is the core of the matter, <laughs> but they would require another half an hour explanation. Um, uh, so. Uh, this kind of uh, 
So this compressed sensing device, device uh, is uh, particularly uh, tuned to uh, be uh, very robust to perturbations in the, uh, say, in the properties, so what you want to predict, uh, but also in the values of the features, because you have a source of errors in, in, on both sides, right? Especially if the features that you plug in, like this, uh, uh, yeah, an harmonic factor uh, uh, comes from some lengthy simulation or they come from some measurement. Uh, so in general, uh, the, 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 the method is, is, is quite robust. Uh, mathematically, this is because the number of, um, say, free coefficients that are trained is by construction very small. So the, 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 the model tends not to overfit. Um, in any case, uh, as I mentioned, uh, uh, the the complexity of the model is determined by the data themselves. So um, uh, if you have more data, you may have more complex models. Uh, in any case, uh, essentially the, um, uh, the robustness is built in by the, by the training procedure because we already do so this cross-validation in order to uh, kind of uh, um, assess that the selected descriptor is, is stable enough. Otherwise, you will get the signature that uh, uh, the model is, uh, has not enough data to make, make it short. OK, there is a question from the chat. Uh, maybe I can ask that. That's from uh, Stefan Peters. Uh, general question. As the big data approaches, um, parentheses, forced, para, uh, forced parallel, as mentioned in the beginning, are becoming uh, more and more established. Will this fourth paradigm completely take over the third paradigm soon? Ah, the third paradigm. Uh, so the third paradigm. Yeah. yeah paradigm, sorry, I don't know, even know if it is the right pronunciation. Sorry, <laughs> I didn't mean to correct you. <laughs> oh, <okay>. um, <laughs> And um, so the third being the, uh, say, computer uh, simulation aided. Uh, um, yeah, I'm not sure. Um, uh, meaning that um, it depends on the question that you ask. Uh, the, the, the third paradigm was really, uh, yes, simulating, uh, say, a complex system, say a liquid or, or something in order to infer some properties. Uh, now you can say yes. Now we 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 do it with the third paradigm. We we try to predict directly the property without doing the simulation. Uh, I sense that that is not always possible. That in some cases the complexity is, is such that uh, you are not able to derive a, a closed model to predict the property. At this as this um, in the same way people were not able to derive closed model to predict properties in complex systems, say hard spheres. Uh, the famous first application uh, of, of, uh, of uh, computer simulation in, in atomistic system. Oh, well, uh, the same in, in, in statistical mechanics. Um, so nobody was able to even predict if, if there was a phase transition in, in our spheres and you needed computer simulation to do that. Uh, so you have a new system, you have some kind of uh, strange matter uh, situation with, with correlated electrons and so on. You may want to do computer simulation uh, with, with, with an uh, accurate model uh, rather than, than doing the artificial intelligence part. Uh, what I see is that uh, uh, probably even the majority of the field is trying to use machine learning to speed up the um, the, 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 the say the traditional uh, simulation, say molecular dynamics, Monte Carlo um, thing. So both on the on, on the model itself, so you have this uh, so-called surrogate uh, potential uh, uh, potentials, like uh, things uh, that the main people would, would be Caborciani in, in Cambridge and your Beller. Um, don't remember now where he is because he just moved. <laughs> I think he's in uh, Bochum. Um, so with neural networks uh, or 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 uh, uh, yeah, uh, kernel Gaussian processes. Um, so this would be just potentials that are faster than uh, the DFT that you train on, or even a higher level. Um, or uh, uh, you could have uh, better schemes for molecular dynamics and Monte Carlo, such that you can kind of guess what is happening next, next, and so on. So artificial intelligence is invading uh, every uh, subfield. Uh, I would say today I, I presented clearly only a part, uh, but I don't believe that that will completely uh, uh, override the, 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 the yeah. Um, 
the third paradigm, so the, the simulation, and certainly we'll never override theory and uh, <laughs> experiments. Most importantly, in, in a talk I gave a few weeks ago, somebody was very uh, uh, worried when I showed that you right. have the, the, the scale of paradigm, and, and then okay, but then we forget about experiments. No, absolutely, it's an empirical science. We need experiments always. <laughs> Cool, true. And actually, um, we have one more question, and I think we have time for one and maybe one small, smaller question. We have one from Norbert again, who's asking something related to this. He says, if I understood correctly, some of the predictions are actually based on some sort of existing physical model, for instance, thermal conductivity. Now, how likely or easy it is to find physical uh, models behavior if I just feed my AI with experimental data? Example, fluid data to find rheological models. So that's a very uh, kind of uh, um, focused question. I, I, I would say um, it, it, you're right. So there, there must be a model. And that model must be somewhat simple so that it can be uh, reached by, by the complexity of, 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 of this uh, strategy. Clearly, you can have more complexity if you have more data. So, but, but at some point, you hit a little bit of a, of a limit. Um, or, uh, typically, it's the memory that, that uh, hits uh, back you, because you have, you have to create all these possible uh, models. And uh, I believe that there will be many situations in which there is a, a not so complex model, let's say, uh, even for very complex situations like uh, yeah, neurological, neurological data. Uh, I think one should just try. I mean, at the end of the day, uh, if you have a good data set to start with, uh, it, it is relatively easy to set up the, the thing and, 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 and try with the features that you may fancy. Uh, what you gain extra than, than training a, a neural network uh, uh, is that you need typically way fewer data, uh, and then you can look in what you have found and then and, 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 and see if that gives you some hint on, on how to, to actually derive a more first principle a model, uh, or uh, at least it gives you an idea on which are the main parameters and how they, they, they play a role. But by all means, I think there are there is plenty of uh, models that are just a little beyond our human capability at the moment, <laughs> at this moment of evolution. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, they, they can be derived by, by a method like the, this symbolic regression. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Now, now my, a very small question for me, just because I'm curious. So from the last couple of applications that you've showed, you've showed some combination of uh, experimental data and um, uh, tools for machine learning. And you said that there are some notebooks on this too, yes. meaning that uh, there are experimental data now on the Nomad repository. Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, no. So the notebooks. That? No, the, 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 the notebooks, uh, the, they, they have the data, uh, let's say, has um, data uh, together with the notebook. So they, they are stored yes, specifically yes, yes. for that notebook. Um, we are working uh, hard on having uh, uh, already something usable from experimental data. So there is a, the, the whole part of, uh, of Fermat that is working on, uh, on metadata for, for experimental data. Uh, cool. The first one that should appear is, uh, is it the one that I showed? Yes. So this um, um, uh, catalysis um, uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, project, uh, the, the notebook is uh, not yet released. It will be soon. Um, and that will have the data already arranged in, in, uh, in the way uh, oh, it will be parsed. It will be mm. the, the future uh, uh, of Fermat. So these are still only this data. So you will not mm -hmm. easily find more, but they are already uh, um, um, yeah, tabulated and, and, and stored uh, in, in, the, in the proper uh, Fermat form. So cool. yes, that will be give, give you an example on how we are going to do that. Uh, 
the okay. coordinator of yeah I, I just close quickly the coordinator of uh, of, of the, the experimental is working hard to get actually the data into the, the archive uh, we'll keep you informed <laughs> what we get fantastic and thank you Luca so can we if we can thank Luca again for first of all waiting a little bit longer than he should have and for his talk <laughs>